The Old Testament reading today, on the first Sunday of the new year, comes from the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 31. It's found on page 734. Let us listen for God's word. For thus says the Lord, Sing aloud with gladness for Jacob, and raise shouts for the chief of the nations. Proclaim, give praise, and say, Save, O Lord, your people, the remnant of Israel. See, I am going to bring them from the land of the north, and gather them from the farthest parts of the earth, among them the blind and the lame, those with child and those in labor together. A great company they shall return here. With weeping they shall come, and with consolations I will lead them back. I will let them walk by brooks of water in a straight path in which they shall not stumble. For I have become a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the coastlands far away. Say, he who scattered Israel will gather him and will keep him as a shepherd, a flock. For the Lord has ransomed Jacob, and has redeemed him from the hands too strong for him. They shall come and sing aloud on the height of Zion, and they shall be radiant over the goodness of the Lord, over the grain, the wine, and the oil, and over the young of the flock and the herd. Their life shall become like a watered garden, and they shall never languish again, then shall the young women rejoice in the dance, and the young men and the old shall be merry. I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them and give them gladness for sorrow. I will give their priests their fill of fatness, and my people shall be satisfied with my bounty, says the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Please pray with me. Lord God, open my mouth that I may proclaim your praise. Silence in us any voice but your voice, so that in hearing we may be obedient to your will. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Every year, just at this time, a question arises within each of us. It is the same question every year, and it goes like this, is it going to be a good year or a bad year? Well, I have an answer for you. God spoke to me loudly and clearly just a few days ago and asked me to pass it along to you. You might want to write this down. The answer is, yes, it is going to be a good year and it is going to be a bad year. Now, let me elaborate a little bit. In 2016, some good things are going to happen and some bad things are going to happen. Someone is going to celebrate a great victory and someone is going to suffer a huge defeat. Someone is going to be born and someone is going to die. Someone is going to say the sermon is too long and someone is going to say, make it longer, Bob. I thank the balcony for that. <laughs> the bottom line is 2016 will be filled with the same joys and the same sorrows that we experience every year. The names may change, the venues may change, but the ups and downs in life will remain the same. As the saying goes, the more things change, the more things stay the same. And so, in 2016, I predict, on the sad side, there will be 
fires and floods and earthquakes. And on the joyful side, we will lose those five pounds that we've always wanted to lose. We will all become vegans. We will change the name of coffee hour to tofu hour. And best of all, greatest of all, the Cubs will win the world. No, I'm not going to say it. It may jinx it. But one thing we can say for certain, one thing is absolutely guaranteed that 2016 will be another year. And because it is a leap year, okay, it's going to be a year and a day. Sounds thrilling, doesn't it? Starting the year with such mixed expectations does not exactly rev the engines and get your juices flowing, does it? Imagine being in a locker room where the coach gives a pre-game pep talk and says something like this, okay, today's game is going to go pretty much like last week's game. We're going to score some points, they're going to score some points, and somebody's going to win. So go out there and win one for the Gipper, but be prepared because you may lose. Such lukewarm words might as well be kept to oneself because if they don't inspire, if they don't motivate and excite, why even say them? Which brings us to the scripture today. The prophet Jeremiah is speaking to the Israelites who are held captive in Babylon. The Israelites always seem to be held in captive, don't they? As virtual slaves, the Israelites can see very little future for themselves. They have no prospects, no energy, and their faith is lukewarm when it exists at all. For them, God is hidden behind a cloud, and everything is in a shade of gray. They can survive as they are, but their survival is without soul. It is without passion. The only thing certain for them is that one day will follow the next day, which will follow the next day. It's like going into a new year believing that it's going to be the same as last year. A few tears, a few laughs, and a general lukewarm experience of life. Blah, blah, blah. Do you know that feeling that the Israelites experienced a life of blah, blah, blah? Over Christmas, my sisters told a story about my dad that I had forgotten. My dad was a Presbyterian minister in Auburn, and so he knew everybody around town, and he knew all the car dealers, and one day he and my mom talked, and they figured out that they wanted to get a new car, and the word got out, and so everybody was coming to him saying, well, I've got a car for you, I've got a car for you. Then one fellow in the church came to him and said, I've got the perfect car for you. And this fellow was a little quirky, but he kept pestering my dad, and my dad finally said, okay, I'll take a look at it, Jim. So they drove to Angola together, and they found the car, and my dad got out, and the car looked pretty nice. He got into the car and turned the key, and nothing happened. Tried it again, nothing happened. Couldn't get anything out of the car. So he gets out of the car, opens the hood, and he says, Hey, Jim, I don't know much about cars, but I'm pretty sure they need an engine in them. <laughs> so we didn't buy that car. And I'm pretty sure my dad never bought a car from that guy named Jim. You see, an engine is important whether it's in a car or whether it's in us, if nothing inside of us can be turned on and energized and motivated, then in life will be a series of one day after another, after another, 
blah, blah, blah. If we can't be turned on to something, we may as well be sitting in a car without an engine. Jeremiah, the prophet, knew this. He knew that without hope, the people would languish in their lives, surviving but not really living. It's an experience that generations of people have endured. Henry David Thoreau said, most men lead lives of quiet desperation and go to the grave with the song still in them. What a sad state it would be to go to the grave with the song still in you. How terrible to live without an engine to bring you to life. How awful to be stuck in neutral. How sad to be lukewarm. How sinful to live behind a cloud in the gray shades of the world. Jeremiah knew all of this. And so he prayed to God for something to rev the engines of the Israelites. And it didn't need to be a miracle burning bush. And it didn't need even to be a star in the sky. All it needed to be was something tangible that the people could experience. Something they, that they could look at and say, wow, that's pretty good. And so the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah and said, Tell the people that God is going to gather Israel. And there shall be singing and dancing, and people will be happy, and no one will languish anymore. I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them and give them gladness for sorrow. And so that's what Jeremiah did. He went to the people and said to them pretty much something like, Stop crying. Hang in there. Rev your engines. You will have gladness for your sorrow. You see, people languish and people become lukewarm and our engines don't start when we don't do anything when we mope around and feel sorry for ourselves that's when the weeping starts it has nothing to do with what's going on in the world out there but it has everything to do with what's going on inside of us A few years ago, when Abby and Lawson were in college, I was as close to languishing as I have ever been. No soccer games to go to, no show choir season to enjoy, no high school drama to keep things perking in the household. It was just Jenny and me staring at each other, wondering, so what do we do now? We had lost our engine. Now, don't get me wrong, looking at Jenny is a good thing. I want to make sure you know that. But we both realized that we needed something more. And so I did a really dumb thing. I signed us up for two ballroom dance lessons. And we went, and we liked it. And we bought two more lessons, and we liked it. And then a few more, and we liked it, and we liked it. And soon the gray clouds started to lift, and I realized that I had rhythm. <laughs> I had soul. I was a virtual dancing machine. And it wasn't a miracle, although you may think that. <laughs> it was just us doing something instead of languishing in our tears. J 
Jeremiah, way back when, gave the people something to do. Latch on to this hope, he said. Hold on to it for dear life. Start singing, start dancing, eat some good food, maybe a little wine, rediscover a reason to rejoice. And that's what the people did. The people acted. And their days got a little better. And in time, they were released from their captivity and they headed home to Judah. So the new year is before us. And it promises more of the same, more sorrow, more joy. Another year older for you and for me. You're going to be 35 this year, right? That's what I thought. Well, the challenge of the year it's not to end all the sorrows, and it's not to add all the joys that may or may not happen. No, the challenge is how we react to all of that, how we react to the world. If we react by retreating into our shell and languishing about with lukewarm emotions, then we are not listening to the voice of God in our midst. For God does not call us to a life of weeping and moping and quiet desperation. God calls us to sing and dance and make merry with the people we love. God calls us to rev our engines in the stillness of life. God calls us to do something. It is this call of hope that God consistently brings to us through the prophets, through Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit. It is the promise that God will turn our mourning into joy and give us gladness for sorrow. Now, should that happen, and when that happens, I think it'll be a pretty good year. And so, gentle people, start your engines. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen.